All right, everybody, welcome once again. It's Wednesday night, which means it's time for another episode of the Red Delta Project podcast and live stream Q&A here on the RDP YouTube channel. It's always on Matt Schifferly, founder of the Red Delta Project and author of the books that help to sponsor these episodes, full link to the descriptions and uh, or the uh, episodes and the library of uh, Red Delta Project titles. It's down below in the description. I'm getting my words all mixed up there. And uh, today we are talking about the ever so important topic of self-esteem. Now, I know this may be like, okay, health and well-being sort of thing, but how does this relate to building bigger biceps and losing another 10 pounds of fat? And as I'm diving into the research for this for one of my future books, I'm realizing it has everything to do with it. Case in point, if you want to do some more research on your own, this is one of the things that got me started on this. Nathaniel Brandon's Six Pillars of Self-Esteem. Pick this up at the local library, so you may be able to find that library or on Amazon, of course. But uh, it's crazy how you can fall down rabbit holes and you start pulling on a little thread of like, oh, maybe there's this little thing that has maybe something sort of correlated to the results that you're getting in your workouts and diet. And as you keep pulling that thread, it just unravels more and more. And before you know it, you're like, oh my gosh, this is like everything. Like everything we're trying to accomplish boils largely down towards your self-esteem. So basically what that means is low self-esteem it's almost impossible to make anything significant happen as far as development and growth in the direction you want. But at the same time, higher self-esteem almost puts your success on autopilot where you almost don't even need to think about it and it starts to come towards you. So why does this all work and stuff? And again, I'm majorly paraphrasing a lot of the information in this, but basically it goes along with one of the topics that I've talked about in the past of that one of the things that we get wrong about this whole fitness thing is that it's all about what we know. Like we need to learn about pull-ups and we need to learn about donuts and we need to learn about workouts and stuff. And that's all fine and good. But ultimately the thing that determines your actions and therefore your outcomes of your habits is your emotional state towards things. So I could teach you everything there is to know about donuts and pull-ups. But ultimately what's going to control and determine whether or not you do your pull-ups and whether or not you eat donuts depends on how you feel about donuts, how you feel about those pull-ups. That's what's really in charge. And psychologists and even social scientists have known this for years that human beings, we are emotionally based creatures. We're not knowledge based, we're not logic based. We're emotionally based. So someone who is seated at, seated at a table and eating salmon and greens and a very healthy diet, they're as much of an emotional eater as someone who is drowning their sorrows in like a pint of Ben and Jerry's, right? We're all emotional creatures. All of our decisions are based on our emotional statement about what we're trying to do. So what this means about self-esteem is essentially self-esteem is kind of like your own perception of your abilities, your own perception of your worth, your own perception of what you can and cannot do. And what that ultimately leads to is how you feel about yourself is going to control your potential. I mean, forget about genetics, forget about the workout you're following, forget about like the science behind your latest diet and everything like that. Ultimately, your potential is dictated by how you feel about yourself and your potential to get something. The reason why this is so important, as we've explored in previous episodes, is that your ability to do the big things in fitness, like losing weight and building muscle, it doesn't come down to what your workout program is. It doesn't come down to how much protein or grams of carbohydrate you're eating and stuff. That's fine, but it's by far and away way more than that. And in fact, your ultimate results depend upon the thousands of subliminally controlled choices you make every single day. So it's not just what are you doing in the gym? It's not just like, what are you having for dinner and stuff? Your ultimate result depends on the thousands and thousands of choices you're making every day and you don't even know it. So most of your life or especially your fitness level is dictated is dictated by autopilot or basically on how you feel. So if your self-esteem is like low, like right around here, I can give you anything in the world for a workout and diet program. You're going to make sure your results are at this same level to match your self-perception of yourself. 
right? But if you're up here, you're gonna follow suit as well. So this is why improving self-esteem is so important because low self-esteem, you're gonna stay stuck at a low level of outcome, regardless of how hard you try to work outwork it. And a good case in point uh, to kind of be as a little bit of a tester is you ever receive a compliment and you just can't like really actually accept the compliment or you know people like this, like you're at a party or something like, oh, hey, I really like your dress or I like your shirt and say, oh no, no, it's a not really good dresses, right? That's a sign of someone having literally the door open wide open saying, here's this good thing, here's this chance to be at a higher level of joy and happiness and stuff. And they are literally refusing to walk through that door because their self-esteem doesn't match it. They are refusing the opportunity to have a better life or at least a better moment to feel better because it doesn't match their circumstances. So this works both for and against you because if something like that happens where the door literally opens up, like here is the path to gains, here is the straight road and the five-step plan to exactly what you want. If that result does not match your self-perception of yourself, you will self-sabotage every single time because your feelings are all about matching yourself in alignment with your reality. How do I feel about myself versus the reality that I find myself in? And whenever you're out of alignment, you will self-sabotage or you will take the necessary actions to bring yourself up or down to match that self-perception. So the whole idea is if you can bring yourself up, all of these thousands of subliminal choices that you need to make every day will just fall into line automatically and you'll be on your way. So let's explore some practical application here on how we can do this. Now, one of the biggest uh, myths about self-esteem that I used to believe that really I'm learning now, which is fascinating, is that a lot of times people think that you can bolster someone's self-esteem through accomplishment through big things like, oh, I'm sure if I got my degree, my self-esteem would improve. Or if I had bigger muscles, my self-esteem would improve. Or if I lost 20 pounds, right? A lot of us get into fitness because we wanna look better and we wanna feel better about ourselves. And theoretically, like once I've got abs and once I've lost weight and once I can bench press a car, then I will feel better about myself and have self-esteem and get my black belt and all these other sorts of things. But actually what's the research is showing is that stuff doesn't work very well. And I know this firsthand because I've accomplished things in life, of course, as we all have. I've got my black belt when I was 16. I've graduated college. I've won bike races and stuff. And momentarily, there's a bump up of like, hey, yeah, I'm the man. I can do this sort of thing. But when you have a habitually low self-esteem, what ends up happening is you will tell yourself stories to bring yourself back down. Like I always said, well, if I got a black belt, then it couldn't be that special. Like I did it. Hell, if I can do it, anybody can do it, right? You hear that all the time. Like if I got it, it couldn't be that big of an accomplishment. So I'm beating myself back down again, right? And here's the thing is accomplishment can boost it a little bit, but the most powerful thing that's gonna make a big game changer for you is that self-esteem is more reflected through our daily habits. Like I said, a lot of times things we're not even aware of, but the stuff that is just small choices we make throughout the day that reflect our self-esteem. So case in point, right? The I've been trying to work on my own self-esteem since reading this and realizing, I mean, I've, I know I've always struggled with low self-esteem for myself, but now I'm really aware of like where it was low and how to bolster it up. So lately I've been noticing just these little things that I do every single day. I'm like, no, 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 no. That, that I deserve better than that. Like I was, I put on a shirt the other day and it's this ratty old shirt. It's got like tears in it and holes in it and the logo on it is falling off and it's got stains on it and everything. And after about two minutes of wearing it, I was like, what, what am I doing with this shirt? Like, why am I wearing this shirt? Like, how did I choose this? No, and basically I demanded more of myself. Like I deserve better than this shirt. I shouldn't be wearing this shirt. That makes me look like a bum. I should be wearing a better shirt. And little things like that done every single day of, I deserve to have a good breakfast. I deserve to have a cleaner room. I deserve to keep my teeth you know, clean and flossed and stuff. All of these things where we're taking care of ourselves because internally and mentally and emotionally are saying, I deserve better than this. That's the sort of stuff that bolter, bolsters your self-esteem. It's little tiny habits every single day that say, I deserve to step up. It's 
having clean clothes, it's washing your car, it's having a good meal, it's getting down on the floor to do your push-ups because you deserve to be stronger. It's recognizing that you deserve better that's important. So all of these little choices, look for these opportunities to just step up a little bit more and demand more. Now you'll come across a lot of ideas in not just our fitness culture, but just society in general that tell you to go in the opposite direction. Be small, be you know, less demanding, be humble and all these sorts of things. And it, this is not at all about arrogance, like stepping up and saying, I deserve to have better food in my fridge is not about arrogance. It's about recognizing self-worth and saying, I deserve better than this. It's literally that choice. It's when you're in your workout and you do 10 repetitions where you before were like, okay, that's good enough and stuff. But the little thing clicks in your mind and you're like, I deserve to be stronger than this. And as a result, emotionally, you'll be like, well, at 10, I used to stop, but no, I feel like I want to keep going because I deserve more than this. Literally just asking more of yourself. And one of the things that can really kind of derail this as well is just blindly following some sort of a plan and not trusting yourself. Having the discipline to know what is best for yourself and then following along with that builds a lot more self-esteem than forcing yourself to do things even if it's against you. Uh, so for example, like, like let's say diet, this happens all the time, right? There's a lot of rhetoric in our fitness culture that is about beating down your self-esteem, telling you that it's your problem, you're addicted, you're at fault, original. So a lot of this doom and gloom stuff you have in religion, it's also very heavy in our fitness culture of you can't trust yourself. You're going to go and eat nothing but junk food. You're going to be addicted to sugar and be lazy for your entire life. So you need someone else to take over for you and tell you what to do. Don't you dare ever make your own decisions. But it's making your own decisions that actually bolsters your self-esteem of recognizing you have two choices and saying, based on my experience, this is the thing that's best for me. I'm going to do that. Those are the sorts of things that really bolster a lot of your self-esteem and your independence and autonomy by saying, I know how to stand on my own two feet. And when someone says, no, you shouldn't be doing that. I'm like, I know what the science says. I know what you think and stuff, but I know what's best for me. Therefore, I'm going to make the choice to do this. And that's what's actually going to be best. So those are the things we want to be looking for these opportunities every single day in your workout, in your dietary choices, when you're getting dressed, your posture, because a lot of how we feel about ourselves is subliminal. But the moment you start standing up and saying, I think I deserve more than this, then you start looking for those opportunities and they become fairly apparent. And the last point I want to make too is the reason why a lot of people are kind of holding themselves back is because they're waiting for someone to give them permission. They're waiting for some sort of a ceremony or an event like, okay, I have knighted you. Good. You are now sir, so-and-so, and you are authorized to lose weight and be happy, right? Someone to give us permission and the green light to go ahead. Because we have these things in society to some degree. We have graduation ceremonies. You get a driver's license and therefore you've passed a test and they say, okay, you are now worthy of being able to operate a motor vehicle, right? So a lot of us are kind of back and they're like, well, how do I know if I'm worthy of the results that I want? And to a degree, this may be feeding that whole idea of like the, the work harder work ethic out there of just beat yourself down with diet. And if it's harder and requires a lot of effort, because one of the signs of low self-esteem is just this unbelievably punishing work ethic of I have to make myself worthy of what I want. And I have to just keep working harder and harder and sacrifice and basically beat myself into the ground until I feel worthy. But the problem is, worthiness of what you want isn't had by crossing some sort of a finish line. It's not happened from an event. If you don't feel like you're worthy now, you're never going to feel worthy for it because no one's going to give you permission to get bigger and stronger. No one's going to say, well, you've been training for five years. Therefore, you now should have a one arm pull up or anything like that. That doesn't exist. So deciding to be worthy, deciding you want more and deserve more is basically the first step. And I know that kind of seems a little new agey, like mumbo jumbo stuff. It's like, what do you mean just decide? Well, here's a, here's a funny story to illustrate this uh, and bring it home, right? There was a short story play that I saw years ago. And the premise of the story is that 
there's five people and they just jump on the stage and they're looking around like they're confused and they're like, what the heck happened? And this woman comes in dressed in white and she's like, hi, yeah, um, I'm an angel and you're all dead. And they're like, what, what, how do, no, wait, wait. And I was like, yeah, afraid so, you're dead. So uh, this is the waiting room for heaven. Uh, you're, you're just waiting here because we're a little full right now. But here's the thing, we do to a computer glitch not all of you are supposed to die. One of you wasn't supposed to die, but the problem is we don't know who wasn't. So here's the deal. I'm gonna leave and you're all gonna discuss amongst yourselves who deserves to go back to earth and continue living their life. So the rest of this, the story and the play is these guys all debating. They're like, well, I'm a doctor, I'm saving lives. If I don't go back, people are gonna die. And, this other guy's like, well, my wife just had triplets. I need to be there for my family. And this other guy's an inventor and going to change the world. And it's just the whole play is just back and forth debate. Why, 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 why? And finally, at the end of the play, the angel comes in and they're all just kind of sitting around because they are nowhere near close to a decision any more than they were at the beginning. And the angel says, all right, who am I taking back to earth? And they're all looking at each other. And nobody has an answer until after a few moments, one of the guys just stands up and says, I'm going back. And the angel says, great, come with me. And they walk off stage and that's the end of the play. And it's kind of this, the story illustrates the idea of just sometimes you have to just stand up and just say, let's do this. I'm worthy of this. I'm the guy to do this. And that's it. No credentials, no like, why do you think you're worthy? Because everybody had worthy, everybody deserved to go back to earth in the play. It's just whoever just stands up and says, I deserve this, let's go. And once you've made that, everything changes. Everything about your diet, your exercise, your quality of life and everything will start to go in a much more of an upward trajectory. The moment you decide, I deserve better than this. I'm not gonna settle anymore. I'm not going to allow myself to be satisfied at this lower level. I'm just gonna go up one tiny bit of a level and you'll find the opportunities and you'll say, great, and you take them and you're on your way. So that's why self-esteem and improving it and just simply demanding a little bit more of yourself and your daily habits can make or break your results. All right, so hopefully that gives you some things to think about. Let's get into some of these live Q and A's. I got lots of people on. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming on. I know that things are a little bit late. I had to work late tonight here at the gym. Ah, good. Jose, or Jose, sorry, <laughs> Jose, <laughs> phonetic spelling there. Constantly feel like I'm worthless, especially when I compare myself to other people. I know exactly what you mean. And you know what's interesting? We all feel like that. Every single one of us feels like that. So let me, let me tell you something. A friend of mine the other day said this, and it really struck home with me. Uh, I think a lot of this, of course, unsurprisingly, comes from social media and the internet. And uh, I was talking about how, like, I, I'm not the best guy on social media. Like, I'll go days without going on Instagram, months without Facebook and stuff like that. Uh, and in my line of work, like, that's not necessarily a good thing because uh, a lot of stuff I do is online. But a friend of mine was saying, you know what social media is? And I said, well, he's like, it's the smoking of our current generation. It's this generation's version of smoking. And everything about that just rang so true because it's like it's something we habitually do. We take like little breaks throughout the day and we're just mindlessly scrolling through our phones and stuff. But it does just as much for our health as smoking does. But it's a mo uh, more of our mental health and emotional health. So here's how we can get around this and start addressing the self-esteem sort of thing. Is if you're basing your self-esteem in comparison to other people, you're, you're lying to yourself in both cases. Okay, so let me give you an analogy from my world of bike racing, right? Now, when I would go bike racing uh, up at Catamount, I always did the four lap category. And I mean, I'm not winning those races. I mean, I was literally towing the line with Olympians. Like, I'm not winning. <laughs> There's no way in hell. But at the same time, like, I'm not the worst guy out there, so I'm not going to lose either. And it was always kind of a little bit demotivating to be in those races because eventually I'd find myself kind of in the middle of nowhere and everybody who's ahead of me is way ahead of me. I'm not going to catch them. And everybody's behind me is way behind me. They're not catching me. So I'd be like, what am I doing out here? I'm bored. I'm tired. And if I compare myself to the people up there, I'm worthless and slow and don't even deserve to be on a bike. But if I compare myself to the people behind me, I'm God's gift to mountain biking. I'm the best in the world right? Both of those are myths. 
They're both lies and they're giving you a false representation of yourself. So that's when I started to realize, I'm just gonna try and beat my time. So I'd do the course and I'd be like, I did an hour and 15 minutes and 38 seconds. Okay, great. And then I'd do it again as hour 13 minutes. Whoa, all right, great, yes. I am going faster than before. This is where we wanna be. We wanna accept ourselves for where we are, okay? And a lot of times, you know, in self-help and stuff, people will say like, acceptance is the first step. And people misinterpret that as acceptance of surrendering to your current condition and saying, I'm, I'm gonna take off the gas and not try and get better. No, 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 that's not it at all. It's it about saying, this is who I am, this is where I am, this is my current situation. And once you have a beat on that, you can say, where's my next step forward? What's one step forward from where I am now? Okay. Now someone's way ahead of you. It's like, I don't care. Like they're, they're not going to help me. Right. And someone's way behind you. What do I care? Who cares? You know, it doesn't, doesn't matter to me. It's like, this is where I am. If you're looking at a map, right. At an amusement park, there's the, you are here arrow because you know where you are. Then you can make decisions on where you want to go in life. It doesn't matter if someone else is over on space mountain. You're like, I don't want to go to space mountain. What do I care? I want to go to the food stands and someone else is just getting their tickets. And it's like, yeah, but what do I care about that? Right. You want to say, how do I get to the food stand? You are here. Oh, it's three, you know, trails up that way or whatever like that. Get real about where you are, accept where you are and take one step forward from where you are. And the more you focus on yourself and the more you focus on your own abilities, recognizing that you have the potential to explode them and go to a higher level, the less you're going to care about what other people are doing and the more you're going to be proud of yourself. So that's my take on that one. All right. Immortal smoke. Isolate each muscle to hit specific angle and strengthen it. See if it's a weak point in your chain to hold you back from all else. Even the best muscle output whole chain working as one is. Yep. And uh, isolation is one of those things that I always use as a, um, it's a therapy, I guess you could say, like, especially from isometric standpoints. Like if you know you've got a weak link in your chain, then by all means work on that weak link. But the major goal is to be able to work that muscle just as well, if not harder, with inclusion rather than isolation. See, if I'm doing an exercise and I'm like, oh yeah, I really feel this in my biceps if I'm doing like curls and I don't feel it in my pull-ups, that's a sign that I'm not engaging my biceps enough during pull-ups. So uh, ideally, I mean, this is pie in the sky kind of objectives, but ideally, if you are doing a compound exercise and then you do an isolation exercise, they should feel exactly the same for that muscle or the compound exercise should feel more powerful in that muscle. That's what we're going for. If it's not quite the case, then yeah, getting a little bit of isolation work uh, can help bring that back up. And uh, then, cause you're gonna work it harder potentially with the compound stuff than with the isolation uh, stuff. Let's see what Michael has to say. As a man thinks, in his heart, so is he. Absolutely. I've grown to tell people who off, uh, offer items that will not help me achieve my goal. Thank you for offering, but I'm in training. I like that because that's a big part of self-esteem too, is recognizing what is on your path too. Uh, there's a lot of advice out there. A lot of it's good, but it's all about knowing yourself and what is actually best for you, not best for you know, according to this research paper, not best according to a dogmatic approach, but what is honestly really actually best for you. Like for me personally, I know that intermittent fasting is not best for me. I've experimented with it. I've played with it. Disastrous results every single time. And I've always been a grazer. I always like eating many times throughout the day, just kind of eating, 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 but basically the opposite. I just know that's best for me been years of using that method, always been the best. So by making those choices and those decisions, that's building my self-esteem because I know that's what's best for me. But another thing that's characteristic of high self-esteem is that when you have good self-esteem about yourself, you have less derision and negativity directed towards others as well. So if someone is saying, okay, this is best for me, and they put other people down who aren't doing the same thing, you know there's still a bit of a self-esteem issue in there. But someone who has a high self-esteem typically uh, helps other people up or they just don't care. And they're like, did you hear what so-and-so said about you? Yeah, 
whatever. Like it's not important to me because the person with the self-esteem is saying, I need to move forward from this point I am. And if they're way behind me or way ahead of me, it doesn't help me in either case. So it's more about just paying more attention to what is most important to you and then walking that path. Uh, fitness emergency, the key to having health esteem is to identify your strengths, not only physical, but intellectual, spiritual, et cetera. Absolutely. We all have our strengths. We all have our gifts and own them, own them as well. You ever, again, this goes to the idea of if someone's complimenting you, can you receive the compliment? If someone says, you are really good at figuring out how to get us unlost when we're lost, you're really good with maps, you're really good at uh, math, you're really good at so-and-so, so can you accept that? I say, thank you very much. I've been working very hard at this. I've always had a knack for this sort of thing. That's a high self-esteem. That's not arrogant. That's not being bolsterous or anything like that. That is being truthful about yourself. And you can even say, yeah, I've always felt really good about this sort of thing. Um, you should um, still got a lot to learn though, like this new thing I'm working on, but thank you very much. Uh, you can receive and honor your strengths so much more when you have high self-esteem, but self-esteem is low, then you're going to ignore your strengths. And that's not going to do you any good. All right. Uh, cool fan. Coming up, do you think increasing the stability demand would give you the same strength gains as increasing load? It depends. It really depends because stability is one of those things where if there's too much instability, it'll definitely hurt your gains. Because as I always say, you're only as strong as you are stable. So if you're really in an unstable environment, then your brain is going to say, shut down the muscles not shut them down entirely, but decrease the amount of tension going through the muscles. It's kind of like if you're on ice or wet grass, right? You can't sprint. Your mind will not let you because you're in an unstable environment. You have these neural signals going through your system saying, don't push it. So the more stability you have, the harder you can push yourself. Now, here's the key is creating intramuscular stability versus external stability. So external stability is things like standing on a BOSU ball, right? You're wobbling around like this sort of thing and everything, that's not gonna help you. You're going to decrease that neural demand, the ability to get stronger. It's kind of a fun thing and good way to kind of test your, your ankle stability and stuff, but it's not going to help you. Intramuscular stability is when you're standing on one leg and your entire leg goes and you tense your quads, your glutes, your hips, your hamstrings. You feel like your entire leg is a pillar of stone. And you feel like you could probably take a punch to the face and still not even fall over. That's intramuscular stability. And intramuscular stability will definitely, if not help you get just as strong, but will definitely open the door to that strength. Because the more intramuscular stability you have, the more you take off those neural breaks and the more your brain is like, oh yeah, let's work the muscles twice as hard. Sure, we've got plenty of safety, we've got plenty of control, damn the torpedoes full speed ahead. So stability is definitely important. That's why we work on it in stage two in grind style calisthenics workouts because you are only as strong as you are stable and if you do not improve your stability, you cannot get stronger. That's why any type of strength like seminar, conference, look online of how to squat more weight, all of that sort of thing. Anything about getting stronger is almost entirely about getting more stable. You know, grabbing the floor with your toes, bracing, wedging, using your breathing, the Vasalva maneuver, packing the shoulders, all of these things that are out there about how to get stronger, they're all about improving your stability. Because the more stable you are, the stronger you either are or can be. Stability is super, super important. Uh, done, Trey. Do I have to do progressive overload on a treadmill? Depends on the objective, man. Uh, but uh, no, I mean, for one, if you're trying to just burn calories, you burn calories no matter what you do. Uh, if you want to be able to run faster, yeah, you're going to have to increase the speed on that sucker. If you want to run longer, yep, you're going to have to increase the distance that you're running. If you want to get good at going in an incline, then yeah. So it, it's more about progression of what? And is that in alignment with your goals? Progressive overload is one of those terms that never really quite sat right with me because it sounds good uh, on paper, but it doesn't mean anything uh, because it's like progressive overload. Okay, 
Progression of what? <laughs> what are you progressing and why? Those are the questions that we really need to ask ourselves because you can progress something and not make any progress whatsoever towards your actual goal. Like if you wanted to burn more calories, speed and or time or frequency can do that. But if you just ran faster, but you compromised other things and you're like, well, it's running at a faster speed, but your calorie burns the same, then you're not, you're not progressive <laughs> in that regard. So get clear on what we want to progress and then focus on that for the, your, your objective. But uh, for the most part, no, uh, in a lot of objectives, no. Uh, what do you think of NoFap and how to deal with severe social anxiety never goes away on its own? I tried everything, still so negative. Uh, yeah, I mean, negativity is like shooting fish in a barrel. And a lot of it, again, comes from social media, a lot on the news and everything, because always remember that fear and anger are tools of manipulation from propaganda. When I was in uh, college, Asian studies major, we studied propaganda from World War II on both Japanese and the American sides. And it's all about fear and it's all about anger and about all about how the other side is evil and dumb and terrible and they want to do this to you and everything like that. Because if you can get someone to be scared and you can get someone to be angry, you can manipulate them to do whatever you want. So almost everything out there is very negative because it's easy to manipulate you to buy shit and it's easy to get you to vote for somebody because we're in election year here in the United States. So everything is so negative and everything like that. But always remember that you don't have to accept negativity. You, you can uh, actively reject it because you only have so much attention. Your attention is your most valuable resource. And if your attention is going towards a negative thing, it can't go towards something positive. And it takes training. It takes uh, awareness and sort of thing. But it's very rare when being negative and fearful is going to be in your best interest. I mean, sure, if you know I'm coming up on a red light and someone is honking their horn, you know, as they're going through the intersection, I'm going to be like, what's that? Oh, okay, because you never know. Someone could be trying to avoid an accident, right? But uh, the chronic negativity that's out there is not doing us any good. So like I said, social media is the smoking of our current generation, uh, especially with mindless scrolling. You can use it in a good way. You can use social media in a good way. You have to really curate it, though. You really, really go through your list of who you're following. And if it's getting negative and there's like angry stuff on there and stuff, drop. I don't care if it's true. You know, someone's like, did you hear what this right wing group said about? I don't care. It doesn't matter. It's not going to affect my day at all. So save the drama for your mama, as I always say, because that's all it really is. All right. Zarate Karate, good to have you on again. Always love having having you on. Weighted calisthenics equals Herculean strength. <laughs> sorry, sorry for the silly question. No such thing as a silly question. The seeking of knowledge is never a silly thing. Yes, weighted calisthenics. Funny you should ask this. I just did some this afternoon for my workout myself. It depends, of course, how you do it. You know, there's no such thing as a method that directly gives you the results that you want. You could do weighted calisthenics and still be weak as, as ever. You know, I used to do that and dips with 70 pounds and I'm like just kind of shrugging and barely bending my elbows and wreaking havoc on my shoulders and everything like that. It's just the method. It's just a it's just a vehicle and your results ultimately depend on how well you can use the vehicle, not the vehicle itself. Remember, exercise doesn't make you stronger. Weighted calisthenics will not build muscle and strength. It's the skills and the abilities and the discipline and the technique you bring to the weighted calisthenics that will get you those results. So a lot of people like them because they're a little bit lower on the skill side of things compared to progressive calisthenics. And you could make the case of, well, that's a good thing because it's easier to work your muscles. Sure. But on the other hand, progressive calisthenics kind of helps us identify weak links and these things that may be creating imbalances. So even if you have a shorter a short initial uptick of strength and muscle with a weighted calisthenics, say, for example, uh, like commando uh, pull-ups or a progressive pull-up, it may be more uh, quick to hit a plateau because there could be an imbalance in there that's hiding uh, because we haven't explored it with more advanced techniques. So I'm always a big fan of both. But yeah, I mean, I've always told the story of Mark, who is unbelievably strong and jacked out of his mind. And all he did was weighted push-ups, dips, and pull-ups. That was it. His entire routine, weighted push-ups, dips, and pull-ups. And he had a body that would rival a bodybuilder. He was strong as hell too. He would he would jump on the pull-up bar with 100 pounds and he would just 
bang out reps, making them look easy. He'd be talking to you the whole time. He'd be like, what'd you do this weekend? And just boom, 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 boom. <laughs> reps after another. It's amazing. Rex, if your occupation demands you lift things, there's a better to weight train and, injure, and risk injury or stick with calisthenics. No, you can do either, man. Uh, remember, the risk of calisthenics depends on you, not the method you have. There's no such thing as an unsafe exercise. There's no such thing as a safe exercise either. Uh, calisthenics can hurt you just as much as weightlifting if you have poor technique. Uh, granted, it's probably a little bit lower on the scale, uh, but uh, either way, you can get hurt if you don't know what you're doing. But if you do know what you're doing, you can be safe as anything with weighted stuff. So again, use calisthenics or weights or both, or whatever you like, but safety is the key. That's why one of my um, little sayings about my approach is always heavy technique, light weight. So uh, when it comes to weighted calisthenics, when it would come to like lifting weights or anything like that, my objective is always how much work can I get out of my muscles with as little weight as possible. So that means uh, maximizing range of motion as big as possible while maintaining tension. Uh, having a difficult technique, so usually this means closer hand and foot position. Uh, so you've got to create some more of that intramuscular stability. Unilateral work uh, can be very good in some cases like this, like single leg deadlifts. You ever try single leg deadlifts? That can be really good for your hips, really, really effective but no one ever wants to do it because it, you can't lift as much weight, but they fall into that trap of thinking, well, the more weight I lift, then that means I'm stronger. Well, it could also mean you're using an easier technique. So I would go with that mantra of light weight, heavy technique, go with a heavier technique. And typically that builds the qualities that can help you be more resilient. Good, good question. Good question. Uh, my son, I've been bullied and had bad experience in childhood. Not even medicine helped me. I took two medicine for three months from psychology. Didn't help at all. Yeah, keep in mind that medical intervention for you know cognitive things is uh, still very much in an experimental phase. I'm not a psychiatrist. I don't really know the workings of it. But uh, as a, a doctor once told me, it's like trying to alter the brain chemistry by injecting and by bringing in medication is like pouring engine or pouring uh, motor oil over an engine. Uh, it's like, it's kind of a crapshoot if it works or if it doesn't. And I uh, feel bad for you, man, when it comes to bullying. I mean, that stuff, that's really scarring. I got picked on quite a bit when I was a kid too, but man, it is nothing compared to what you folks uh, put up with now. I mean, in all honesty, I probably was just really oversensitive when I was a kid. I probably wasn't even really getting picked on that much. Because I look back on what kids said to me and how they treated me and stuff. It's like, actually, I think they were just trying to be my friend. But I was so sensitive that if you looked at me funny, I would take it personally. Like, oh, they don't like me. Oh, they're making fun of me. And oh, this is that sort of thing. And now, hell, I get worse gruff talking smack with my friends when I'm throwing darts on a Friday night. You know, so but nowadays, I mean, it's just evil and very derivative. And again, these people, I know it sounds cliche, but the people who bully are legitimately the ones with the problems. Uh, so what I always take is the approach of just get as much positivity in your, into your life. You can't push negativity out. You can't uh, forget it. You can't get rid of it, but you can push negativity out by pulling in a lot of positivity. So surrounding yourself with a lot of positive friends positive messages on social media, positive ideas, get excited about a project that you're developing, like learning an instrument or uh, planning a trip or something that, uh, you know, uh, you're, you're nervous about travel. It's okay. Let's plan a trip to Italy, right? And let's go to, to sample the cuisine in France and stuff like that. Positive stuff. We can't get rid of negativity, but we can bring in more positivity. That's the only way that I've been able to, to kind of get around uh, that sort of thing. It's certainly not a quick fix, but positivity uh, for the win all day long. Drake, is it accurate to call training for power lifts, PRs, or hard calisthenic skills as pure strength training? Strongman com competitors don't train that way, do they? Accurate to call training for power lifting PR? Well, I mean, it's relative to the lift. You know, if, if you've got a clean and you do it with more weight, there's a PR. If you jump a higher uh, height or longer distance, there's a PR. PRs are always relative to the exercise. Um, 
when it comes to power, yeah, that is a little different than strength because power is a reflection of uh, the time of strength. Like if you stand up, you know, that's a certain amount of force against the ground. But if you jump, that's more force in a shorter period of time is creating more power sort of thing. So it is relative to the whole thing. But don't get the too confused. Like train for power if you need power. Train for strength if you need strength. Um, in my gym where I work at, we have different classes with different different focuses. And we have one class that is power based. It's very much about hip explosive power uh, sort of stuff. A lot of jumping, a uh, lot of uh, skipping, uh, punching, you know, explosive pushups, that sort of thing. And so power is power, strength is strength. Don't try to correlate the two as like, well, if I'm this powerful, then I'm this strong, or if I'm this strong, I should have that kind of power. Strong men care about strength. So they'll focus on their strength. And if you need to jump or if you need power, then you have focus on power. Uh, it's There is carryover, of course, but uh, make sure that you are focusing on which one is the most important for you. Or you can do, of course, do both. Any thoughts on creating martial arts videos, kicking techniques? Uh, good question, Michael. I uh, never really thought of that. I'll have to sit on that one for a while. Uh, my kicks have been getting a hell of a lot better lately just because I've created a hell of a lot more strength and stability in my hips these days. Standing leg circles, um, I think that's an exercise that I, I give you in uh, my bodyweight training for martial arts book uh, as a stability exercise. I know it's in grind style calisthenics, but that's a really good hip exercise, good for mobility, strength, and stability. And uh, the more stability you have in your hip, the better. And actually, it's kind of interesting because the thing about doing a kick, uh, even not in martial arts, like a soccer kick and stuff, the hip strength that determines the most success of a kick isn't the kicking legs hip, it's the standing legs hip. If you create more stability in your supporting leg, and largely that comes from the hip of the supporting leg, you're going to have greater mobility, strength, and power in the kicking leg. So that's kind of the way to think about it is more strength and stability in the standing leg makes the kicking leg stronger and more powerful. Good question. Are hand grips worth it? I'm a big fan of anything that's going to improve your grip, man. Anything. I mean, you can use towels. You know, you can wrap a towel around grips sort of thing. Uh, one of the techniques I know that uh, uh, they used to do in the old days is they'd take dumbbells and stuff and they'd wrap one layer of duct tape around the dumbbell handle. And the next workout, they'd do another layer and then another and another. And that was a way to progressively fatten up the grips. So anything that's going to be a fatter grip is going to be stronger for your grip. It's fantastic, wonderful. Uh, you can put it on and off. And uh, yeah, it's definitely worth it. I love grip training, anything that can help your grip. And I'm going to be coming out with some reviews on some unique grip tools uh, that I'm going to be getting fairly soon. So keep an eye on the the channel for that. But uh, basically, yeah, anything that makes a big, beefy, meaty grip works really well. Another thing that works well is not only a big, beefy grip, but a grip that rotates. That's really going to challenge things like crazy. So uh, you could do that very quickly with uh, PVC and you get a big, thick, honking PVC pipe, run a rope through it and tie it with like a double fisherman's knot. And then you just sling that over a pull-up bar and try and hang off of that because now it's not only a fat grip, it's a rotating grip. Oh, oh, oh. That's going to spark you. That's going to get your grip really working. Uh, another cool fan. We have a question. Do you think kip-ups could be an alternative to Olympic lifts? I can't do them, by the way. Um, it, interestingly, no. I mean, there's no direct equivalent of one exercise to another, uh, first off. Uh, you can't get the same benefits of one exercise from another exercise. There's definitely carryover. Like if you're strong in squats, you'll have pretty strong lunges. But uh, from an explosive standpoint, there is some carryover. But if you want to be strong in a clean, you got to do your cleans. If you want to be strong in kipping, you have to do your kipping. Um, usually, I'm, I usually just use a pull-ups with the, the grind style method. You know, skip the kip, that sort of thing uh, like that. Also on grip, Leonardo Crow, my wrists don't want to grow. What can I do? Well, probably nothing. Uh, your wrists, there's almost nothing here to, to grow tendon and, and uh, tissue-wise. Like your forearms, like this is, this is your grip muscles right here. But this is largely genetic right there. Uh, your wrist uh, diameter and stuff, that's pretty much going to stay the same uh, for life. So... Uh, probably not going to happen very much. I mean, improve your grip by all means. 
you know, definitely beef up that forearm because if you beef up all of these muscles, that's going to have some carryover. I mean, there's a little bit of muscle here, so it's definitely going to help. But the actual wrist right there, uh, that's typically just it is what it is, and it's going to probably stay the way it is. All right. Now there's Zerati Karate. Can you become incredibly strong with calisthenics alone? Absolutely. How many one-arm handstand push-ups can you do? And most people say they can. I'm like, well, then you got work to do <laughs> kind of thing. And that's always kind of the litmus test that we can judge by uh, things like that, like the Big Ten and convict conditioning. Like how many of those Big Ten can you do? And nine times out of 10, most people can't do anything. Maybe the hanging leg raises and even that ugly as sin kind of thing. So if there are exercises that you can't do, you can always get strong because that's really the 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 child the question we should be asking ourselves is can I get better than I am right now? You know, sometimes people say, well, you can't, you know, look at this power lifter, they can lift 800 pounds and it's like, well, can you lift even 300 pounds? It was like, no, it's like, well, then what do you care about the power lifters doing? Like what can you do to get yourself 1% better than you are? Again, get back to the you are here arrow. Where are you now? And then how do you get one step forward? And chances are extremely good. I don't know anybody who can uh, do like 21 arm pull-ups and, you know, one arm push-ups with their feet close together and things like that. So there's definitely a lot of room we can always improve and get uh, to a whole new level. All right. One more question. One more question. Where shall we go for this one here? Scrolling through. All right. Last question. Cap Delts, awesome screen name here. What, uh, how should one train and program core training? Same as any other muscle, progressive resistance, make it work progressively harder. That's the big mistake that people make is they just keep their core training exercises exactly the same. And actually, that's one of the big mistakes they make with calisthenics. They just keep doing more reps and more reps and more reps and more reps. My general rule of thumb when I do my uh, ab training and stuff is the same as anything else. I don't want to do anything that I can do more than 12 to 13 reps on. If I can do more than 15 repetitions, way too easy. It needs to be harder. It needs to be harder. Same, and that's why people are like, you can't do 100 push-ups. No, God, no. Why would I ever want to do a push-up? That's so easy. I could do 100 repetitions of. So core training, same exact thing. Uh, keep it strict. Big range of motion. So things like hanging leg raises, like get the, get the legs up and kill the momentum. But remember that your abs are not responsible for lifting your legs, but your pelvis. So focus on lifting up that pelvis and getting the legs up and pause it at the top. That's a big litmus test for a lot of people. A lot of people can lift their legs or kick their legs, in other words. They're kind of using a tempo like this kind of thing. But can you lift, stop, count to two, and then come down? Nine times out of ten, you'll have up and then come down quite a bit, and then you can hold for a few seconds. So that's one way you can do it. Uh, I'm a big, big fan of stretch outs on suspension straps. I just put a uh, video up on the Red Delta Project Instagram of me do doing that the other day with a whole new level of uh, range of motion because finally my right shoulder is feeling better after about eight months and uh, got mm, it's fairly straight. It's getting there. It's getting to pretty much. But when I do that, I'm looking at five to six reps max. You know, I don't want to be able to do a whole lot of, of uh, repetitions. I keep the weight really, really, or the resistance rather, really, really hard. And that's one of the reasons why I love that exercise on suspension straps, because you can make that incredibly difficult through leverage, backing yourself up, stretching yourself out forward more, keeping that posterior pelvic tilt. But uh, yeah, basically training abs is exactly the same as training any other muscle. Progressive resistance uh, if you want to make it stronger, challenge your strength. You want to improve stamina, challenge your endurance, and so on. But uh, abs are no different than any other muscle for that one. So how would you program back training? How would you program your legs? Well, program your, your abs for the exact same thing. All right. So thank you, everybody. Well, uh, once again, I sincerely appreciate it. Again, I'll get to the other questions later when I answer in comments. I do sincerely appreciate your attention this evening. I know I came on a little bit late. Once again, uh, check out the book, uh, Six Pillars of Self-Esteem, Nathaniel Brandon. Again, link is down below in the description as well as the other books in the Red Delta Project Library, Grind Style Calisthenics, Overcoming Isometrics, Smart Body Weight Training, et cetera, et cetera. Your, appreciate, your support is always greatly appreciated. And if you like this and you're listening to it on the podcast, 
reviews and stuff help spread the word as well. I will talk to you next week. Till then, be fit, live free.